Hi, I'm Simon Jones, the director of the short film Extraction Protocol. In this tutorial, I'll be taking a look at the film's opening shot, which was created using a combination of HitFilm Ultimate and PFHO. Before we get started, let's quickly break down how the shot works. I'd also recommend making sure you're sitting comfortably and fetching yourself a tasty beverage, because this is a bit of an epic tutorial. Here's what I started with. This was shot on a cam dolly from TubeTape.com, which is a highly customizable portable dolly system. During the shoot I wasn't 100% sure that the shot would actually work, so we also shot a few alternative versions with simpler camera moves. As it turned out we were able to use the intended shot without any problems, but it's always worth having a few backups. The shot was first tracked in PFO Pro 2.2, which calculated the 3D camera tracking data I needed to create the shot and hit film. The sky then needed removing from the original shot, which turned out to be rather less painful than expected, as the lighting conditions on the day enabled me to simply use a luminance key for most of the shot, with only a small amount of rotoscoping needed to tidy things up. Stock images of buildings were used to build up the cityscape roughly in 3D, then a smoke particle effect was added to give the scene some atmospheric depth. A light flare was parented to a 3D point to create an animated sun, and the shot was then graded so that everything matched. Right, let's take a closer look at the techniques used here, kicking off with the 3D camera track. I'm going to be using PFO Pro 2.2 in this tutorial, but the general concepts will also apply to any other decent camera tracker. Before we take our clip into PFO, we need to do one thing and hit film. This shot has a slight complication, you see, in that we have our actor moving through the frame. A 3D camera tracker works out the movement in a scene by comparing the relative movement of static points within the frame. If you have elements in the shot that are moving separately from the camera movement, it's going to go haywire. To fix this, I'm going to create an image mat, which will tell PFO where the moving actor is so that it can ignore him in the calculations. An image mat is a black and white image. PFO will ignore any white areas. Some camera tracking software lets you create image mats, but with PFO you'll need to import one you've created elsewhere, in this case, in hit film. To make an image mat, I'll take the video and create a new composite shot from it. I'll then add a couple of new planes. The first one I'll make black and put it as the bottom layer. The second plane I'll make white. In the white plane's transform controls, I'll drop the opacity down to zero. This lets me see the video layer underneath while I work. Now I'll scrub through until the actor appears in the shot and draw a rough freehand mask onto the white plane around him. Don't forget, although I'm drawing a mask around the actor, I've added the mask to the white plane, not to the video layer itself. By turning on keyframing for the mask's path, I can now go through the clip and animate the mask to follow the actor's movement. Because we're not using this mask for actual compositing, it doesn't need to be particularly accurate. As you can see, I've made it very loose. Because it would be astoundingly boring to watch me drawing this mask for the next 5 minutes, I'm going to use the power of editing to skip to the end. Now that I've finished drawing the mask, I can go back to the plane's transform properties and put the opacity back to 100%. You can see the white shape following the actor now. I'll turn off the video layer so that I just have the white shape moving about on a black background. The image mat is now ready for export. I'll switch to the export screen and switch to the image sequence export option. Ok, fast forward. Now that I've got the image mat ready to go, let's fire up PFHO. I'm just going to skim through this because PFHO comes with its own documentation that you can check out for extra detail. The basic process is to import your video, then import your image mat if you need to use one. As you can see, the image mat has marked the area that will be ignored during the tracking. I'll set the in point for the track to something sensible, because there's no point tracking the empty space at the start of the clip. I'll crop it into frame 201. The next step is to track the features, which will take a little while depending on the length of the shot. After this you need to set the scene orientation. This helps to make sure your floor is in the right place and that your camera is the right way up. I'll then hit the solve for camera motion button and let PFO do the maths. That looks like a pretty good track. I'll use the adjustment tools to rotate the floor plane around to better match the direction of the shot, then hit the big 3D button to export the camera data. In the options, make sure you select the third export format. It's called <coughs> After Effects.ma. HitFilm was designed specifically to work with the .ma format because all the major camera tracking apps support it. So no matter what you're using, you'll be able to get the data into HitFilm. Back in HitFilm, I'll click the little drop down arrow on the import button and select 3D camera tracking data. After I've selected the MA file that PFO produced, an import window will appear with a few options. The name field will be used to name the composite shot that is about to be created, so you can change that if you want. Always check the frame rate setting. 
Hitfilm takes this from the .ma file, but some camera trackers are a little eccentric when it comes to specifying this. If it's displaying something you know is wrong, simply update it to the correct value here. You can choose how many of the tracked points you want to import. I'm going to go for 100. As you can see, Hitfilm has already located the associated video file, so you can choose whether to import this at this stage or not. I'm not going to bother because I already have the video imported in this project, but it can be a useful time saver. A new composite shot has been created containing the new camera data. If I scrub through it, you can see the camera is already animated to match the movement of the camera in the live action shot. OK, I'll just drag the original video onto the timeline. Because I only started the track at frame 201, I'll need to trim the video layer accordingly. There's a few ways you could do this, but I'll change the timeline timecode by right-clicking it and choosing Display as Frames, then skip to frame 201 and trim the video layer to that point, then shift it back to the start. Obviously you don't normally need to do this, it's just in this particular case. Although I'm working in a 3D space now with a 3D camera move, I'm going to leave the video as a 2D plane. This means it will always be projected directly onto the frame, unaffected by the camera move itself. This means that any 3D items I put into the scene will match up with the movement in the video layer. 3D camera tracking is absolutely a complete optical illusion trick, but it works perfectly. There's a whole bunch of null tracker layers on the timeline. These are reference points that PFO created, which can now be used to accurately position items in the 3D world. For example, null track 21 happens to be on the top of this building in the background. If I took the position coordinates of this point and pasted them onto another layer, it would then occupy that same position. For example, here's something I made earlier. This flashing 3D text has the exact same position properties as the null point, so as I scrub through the timeline, the camera moves in tandem with the live action shot, ensuring that the text appears to be in position over the top of the building. Right, the next step is to remove the sky from the shot. To do this, I'll first select the video layer and click Make Composite Shot. I'll name it Foreground. The easiest way to get rid of the sky in this case is to use a luminance key. Once I've added the effect, I'll set it to key out brighter and a middling threshold, and the result is surprisingly good. I then use the matte cleaner effect to smooth the edges and choke it in by two pixels, which cleaned up the edge. Alas, a little bit of masking was required to remove the trees from the skyline, but that wasn't too tricky. These techniques won't always work for sky removal. The specifics of the shot will usually dictate the techniques required, but for this shot, this worked really well. I can now switch back to my main composite shot. The foreground composite shot is neatly embedded and ready to go. Next up, I need to start creating the new background. I used a mixture of stock images to create the background. To start with, I put in a new sky using this photo, which is a considerable improvement over the dreary British sky from the original shot. If I quickly drop the sky into the shot on the layer beneath the foreground, it already looks pretty good, but as soon as the camera starts moving, you can see it's just stuck on a static image. That's because the sky layer is still in 2D mode. I'll switch the sky layer to 3D so that I can position it properly. When a layer is made 3D, it defaults to the centre of the scene, which in this case is nowhere near where the camera is pointing. You can see though that the sky comes into view at the end of the shot as the camera pans around. If I switch to a two view layout, we can start transforming the sky layer so that it works properly. In the top view, you can see all the null points from the camera track. These points represent the position of the taller buildings in the original shot. This gives us a reference point for the sky and the other buildings we're going to add. They all need to be behind these points in 3D space for the scene to work. I now take the sky layer and rotate, reposition and scale it so that it works as a giant backdrop in the 3D scene. It helps to have two views set up for this so that you can quickly scrub through the timeline to see how the sky looks in the actual shot. Once the sky fills the shot and there are no holes, we can move on to the actual buildings. For this I use various stock photos of buildings from around the world, including the CN Tower from Toronto as a fair few of you spotted. With each of these images I first had to remove the unwanted parts using similar techniques to the ones I used on the main video. Of course it was a lot simpler for these still images as there's no camera movement to contend with. I created a composite shot for each stock image and prepared them there. That way I could then easily embed the comp as many times as I wanted in my main shot to build up the city. It's then a matter of positioning the buildings however you want them. There's no right or wrong way of doing it, you just want to go for whatever looks best dramatically for your shot. I'll skip forwards a little bit. You can now see that I've positioned my buildings in 3D space, distributed to fill the shot and give it a good sense of depth as the camera moves. There's a couple of obvious problems here. First up, the images all look far too pristine, and could do with a spot of grading to blend into the shot. 
I'll add a grade layer between the video and the background to do this, which will enable me to grade all the background layers in one go rather than having to do it individually. I'll add a simple blur to the grade layer so that it's not quite so sharp, although I will turn it down so it's just a level of 2. The video we shot wasn't that sharp and it's important to make sure that all the layers match convincingly. I'll then add a colour wheels effect, drop the saturation and exposure down a bit to better match the dull greyness of the video layer. The second problem is that there's no sense of atmospheric depth. Unless it's a really, really clear day, buildings that are far away will be obscured by atmospheric haze, losing contrast and detail the further away they are. In 2D compositing you can fake this by individually colour correcting layers so that the more distant ones lose detail. However, one of HitFilm's cool features is that its 3D particle simulator exists in the same 3D space as all the other 3D layers. This means that we can add atmospheric haze using a more realistic method. In the effects panel, search for the fluffy cloud effect. This is a pre-built simplified particle effect that is available in both HitFilm Standard and HitFilm Ultimate, and is very useful for adding realistic 3D atmospheric depth to shots. I'll drop it onto the timeline. Don't forget that 2D layers on the timeline split the 3D scene, so you need to make sure that the cloud effect is in the same area of the timeline as the buildings. Here I've put it just below the video and the grade layer, so it'll work fine. I can now position the clouds so that it sits right on top of the buildings and scale it up to fill the whole area. Depending on where I position it, I'll get different results. If I increase its height, it'll look more like high cloud. If I have it lower, it works as a general pollution haze. I used three separate fluffy clouds in the end, each scaled and positioned differently to create the shot and extraction protocol. An artificial sun was also added to the shot. This is nice and easy to do in a 3D composite shot, even though the light flare effect itself is only 2D. First, I'll create a new point layer. I'll then switch this to 3D and position it up in the sky at the back somewhere. If I scrub through the timeline, you can see the point moving appropriately. I'll now add a new plane layer and drop a light flare effect onto it. In the layer's properties, I'll change it to an add blend. In the light flare's controls, I can now go to the hotspot position properties and set it to use the new point. I'll change the position to 0, 0 so that the light flare sticks onto the point precisely. Now as the camera moves around, the light flare animates automatically. No keyframing required at all. And that's pretty much it. Hopefully this tutorial will have helped you understand how to integrate 3D camera tracking with HitFilm, plus teach a few useful techniques for creating virtual 3D backdrops and imbuing them with realistic atmospheric depth. As with all our tutorials, don't feel you need to copy these techniques exactly. Instead, use them as a springboard to explore your own ideas and concepts. HitFilm is capable of handling pretty much anything you throw at it after all. We've got more tutorials coming up every week, so make sure you hit that subscribe button if you don't want to miss anything. If you have any comments or requests for tutorials, let us know in the YouTube comments, or on the hitfilm.com blog, or on Twitter and Facebook. Thanks for watching.